So let me first start by introducing uh, our speakers. First, Thomas Arnold, your uh, advisor for SDG, Sustainable Development Goals at the DG Research and Innovation European Commission. Thank you for joining us. Frances Guy, uh, next to you, you're a CNRS a Senior Researcher Emeritus and uh, the Vice President of the Ocean and Climate Platform. Next to you, uh, Peter Jensen, you're the head uh, of the Secretariat of the International Resources Panel, uh, part of the UN Environment Programme. Thank you as well. Uh, next year to you, Malik Galab. Uh, you're also a senior researcher emeritus, uh, and you uh, work in the CNRS LAAS, that stands for the Laboratory of Analysis and Architecture of Systems in Toulouse. You're a specialist of artificial intelligence and robotics. Thank you for joining us. Next to you, François Ayrant, an anthropologist and sociologist, uh, chair of the Migration and Societies uh, for, at the Collège de France. You're also a director of the Migration Institute, coordinated by the CNRS. Next to you, Lamine Gay, uh, coming from Senegal, director of the CNRS Environment, Health and Society International Research Lab. Welcome. And finally, Stephanie Thiebaud, director of the CNRS Institute of Ecology and Environment. Good. We're going to speak about um, the so-called international expert panels. And in fact, we're going to speak about many different things. But we will start with those panels that we know the most. There are international panels that have been set up to address uh, major societal challenges so that, such as climate. The IPCC is probably the most popular one, the most famous uh, one. But there, is, there are similar panels that were initiated by the United Nations uh, to tackle biodiversity or resources. But how we will, um, as we will very quickly figure out, we will speak about other disciplines with you all. So can I start with you, Thomas, with the European Commission? you are uh, dealing with several of these panels. Do you want to set the scene and help, and, uh, help us understand what we're talking about here? Okay, does this work? Yes. Listen to the scientists. So this is one of the uh, openings in many speeches of Greta Thunberg. There is a tremendous opportunity and the responsibility currently for international panels to contribute to policy making to shape uh, societal debate and also youth engagement. Climate change is here. Now, every day, we experience it. Uh, three uh, special IPCC reports, one on uh, 1.5 degrees, one on uh, oceans, one on land, they have made it very clear that uh, 1.5 degrees is already heavily impacting several ecosystems, biodiversity, food security, two degrees, this is much worse. The world is off to at least three degrees currently, if not more. We know from uh, the global assessment of the IPBES that uh, we are uh, having uh, mass extinctions and extinction of, bio, uh, of species as we've never had in uh, humankind in uh, the last uh, decades. So all this, and there's also the resource panel coming up, all this adds up to a perfect storm with a multi-crisis of climate change, environment, social crisis in many uh, countries. Rockström calls this a planetary emergency. And uh, the head of uh, states and government of the EU in the EU uh, Council conclusions have recently noted that climate change is an existential crisis. So, how do we deal with existential crisis? This is what currently international expert panels is about. This was for setting the scene. Now, the IPCC is the oldest of uh, those panels uh, set up as an intergovernmental panel, intergovernmental panel on climate change in 1988. And then there's a younger uh, brother or cousin or sister uh, which is joined in 2012, which is the International Panel on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And both those panels now are really providing very important knowledge for policymakers, 
and uh, the European Commission is very actively supporting them. So we are uh, giving grants to those uh, panels. We are uh, politically supporting those panels and uh, their uh, results. We are also funding upstream research. So for instance, without having upstream research on low emission scenarios, the 1.5 degree report would not have been uh, possible. So how do those panels uh, work? Uh, they're in the governmental panels. Uh, yes, they have a multidisciplinary group of experts, but at the end of the process, there's a government screening of uh, the summary of our policy makers, which is then agreed in uh, conferences like the latest one in Monaco for the 1.5 uh, degree report on uh, the oceans. Does the commission also work with the resources panel? The resources panel, now those are the two intergovernmental panels. There are many other uh, panels uh, we use also for our policy work. So one is the resources panel, which will be presented to you separately. And there are also much more informal panel, like for instance the IPES Food, which is a panel of independent experts, uh, which has developed uh, food uh, science and uh, has been very operational and has uh, been taken up uh, in our Food 2030 initiative. So very often uh, the results of those panels, they shape uh, policy initiatives. And maybe just to uh, mention one other one, is the Global uh, Sustainable uh, Development Report, which was recently uh, in September published. Uh, and this is a panel of independent experts, scientists, nominated by the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, and they've worked very much about the big uh, sustainability transitions, uh, helping us to move for, uh, forward uh, to uh, implement the SDGs, which is not only uh, ticking boxes, but really big uh, systemic uh, shifts like the food system, the energy system, and many okay. other of the unsustainable systems. I think I stop. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Peter, can I come to you? Uh, you're directly involved in the resources panel, hence my question. Do you want to tell us what it's all about? Yeah, um, but let me just reflect a little bit on panels, uh, because I think one of the uh, panels are set up uh, at what we call the science policy interface in order to make sure that there's information available for policymakers um, in for the decisions that they need to take so it becomes knowledge-based decisions decision based in reality and not in whatever is happens to be on the cover of whatever magazine just came out the day before they made a policy um, so therefore the, the the trustworthiness is important um, and I think that is sometimes one of the, the challenges with panels like the IPCC and IPBES is that at the end of the scientific process, you then have these negotiated conclusions in the summary for policymakers, which is where you are transforming the science into policy, saying what is it that policymakers should do. Um, and there you run into what are the oil producing countries going to do? Uh, what should the rich countries do? What should the poor countries do? All of these political balances that the UN system is full of, uh, all of these have to be put into that. If we then take something like uh, the International Resource Panel, um, we have, so we say, a slightly more independent role, partly because we do not have a political convention behind us. Um, we are a panel set up by, uh, by the UN together with a group of countries that saw uh, resources as one of the key drivers of the way we use resources, one of the key drivers behind um, the decline in biodiversity and behind the climate problem. And therefore, they needed uh, further knowledge on, on how, to, how to improve resource efficiency and to really understand the scale of the problem. How does this interact with the Sustainable Development Goals, for instance? If we are to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, we need three, four, five planets, something like that the way we are doing it today. So they needed knowledge on that, but there the key issue was then how do we secure the independence of what is going on? Um, and there the structure we have set up uh, is that we do have 
uh, a steering committee consisting of all of the countries that are involved, and we have 30 countries involved, in asking political questions to the panel. What are the implications of this? What are the implications of that? Um, but with those questions, we then leave the scientists alone um, to come up with their scientific conclusions. Um, and once they come up with the scientific conclusions, they then hand that back to the policymakers, and it's then up to the policymakers, like the European Commission, like the US, like Canada, like France, uh, to take these and, and use them in policy making. So does that mean that in this case, the, the, the research is commissioned by the program? The, uh, the way it works is that um, the researchers that are part of the panel, 40 researchers from all around the world, uh, they work pro bono for the panel, um, but they are, of course, allowed by the institutions to be part of that. We then have a little bit of funding that can go into uh, funding research assistance to help them crunch data and things like that. Uh, but they are in there in a personal capacity. They do not represent countries. We have had countries come and talk to us and say, can we get rid of that researcher? And we say, well, no, you can't. They're in there for scientific reasons, not for political reasons. Um, so we are really trying very hard to guard the independence of the panel. Um, and all that sometimes also means coming up with conclusions that policymakers may not like. Uh, but I mean, that is the nature. We are living in a time of fake news. Um, and we have to be brave enough to, to stand up for what we believe and what we can document is the scientific truth here. Very good. That sets very well the scene, actually. And Stephanie, can I come to you? Uh, because that sounds like uh, uh, what well, your institute is involved into several, uh, several of these panels, but from a researcher's perspective. So do you want to tell us about the involvement of researchers? Yes, that's true. Thank you very much. Uh, that's true that uh, the, uh, the CNRS, because uh, it's a CNRS anniversary, uh, through its uh, researcher, but also through the institute concern, as well as uh, a liaison with the uh, Alliance for Environment, that we call Alonvis, which uh, uh, make together all the organisms on environment and ecology. Um, is increasingly involved in the negotiation and the climate and on the, uh, the, the impacts of uh, global change. And that uh, the CNRS has a researcher in the panels of experts for IPBS missions, but also, and this is also true for IPCC. IPCC is uh, in French is GIEC. Uh, as main or they, they are in as main or secondary authors uh, for uh, for uh, the, the reports of, of the evaluation and to uh, as reviewers too, or even more, more directly uh, in negotiation, as you mentioned. And uh, I can say that, uh, that since uh, COP21 in uh, 2015, the place and role of researchers in the international conferences, for example, has, bec uh, has become better understood, tolerated, and now maybe in demand. Very good. Should we go around the other speakers? Uh, we've, uh, we've spoken about uh, uh, a few of the panels, but uh, add to the mix here. You are not all uh, coming from a climate or diversity or resource perspective. What are we talking about here? Do you want to come in with other initiatives uh, that you're working on? Who wants to come in? Françoise. Yes. So I am coming from the CNRS first, but I have also a role in the Ocean and Climate Platform, and I think that it's a good example of what scientists can uh, do in the future when they are not uh, so young that uh, the primary producer uh, of researchers are. So I think that uh, what we why we, we create this type of uh, platform um, with a core group of scientists and of uh, scientific institutions. Uh, it is because uh, we were uh, interested by uh, promoting the role of ocean uh, in uh, the climate system. Why? Because uh, if you look at the different uh, uh, cope. Uh, we just um, 
observed that before the COP21 one, uh, nothing was said about the ocean. We were talking about forests, about uh, water, but not about the ocean. 20 years, we were without any word about the ocean. So our goal with the UNESCO and the IOC was uh, to aggregate some energies and to try to uh, describe and to convince that the ocean was very important in the climate system. And with the help of uh, other NGOs, but also uh, scientific, European scientific institutions and uh, international ones, we were able to work with um, uh, different states, small island states, for example, and uh, the result was uh, very impressive because, well, we were able to have in the uh, COP21 agreement uh, the ocean named. And so this was the first uh, result, positive result of our action. And after that, if you look at the way in which this ocean is presented, it is not an environment, it is an ecosystem. And the fact that the United Nations accept that this type of environment is an ecosystem is changing also the way in which you will look at such an environment. So the second thing that I want to, to say is that uh, we have different process at the United Nations, but uh, one also was uh, previously very important for us. It was the process of uh, World Ocean Assessment. And the World Ocean Assessment was just before the COP21 uh, under the responsibility of the General Secretary of the United Nations. And the way of working in this type of uh, uh, process was like the community, the research community is working. It means that we were several to, uh, for writing a paper, and then we were asking for reviewers to write <coughs> all the things. And at the end, we had also the possibility to um, receive the review of the states, and for me it was very impressive. Okay. Because, well, it was absolutely different from the review, from scientific review. Uh, it means that, well, what is obvious for you is not for the policymakers. So you have to translate sometimes uh, the scientific results in. Uh, words which are acceptable for a different type of governance. Well, and this link between scientists or scientific world and, uh, and the policy makers is certainly one of the common threads uh, across all these different panels. Who would like to come in? Malik, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, with respect to, to AI, the uh, IPCC um, model, there are commonalities and, and similar fe features uh, that uh, are, for example, the need to anticipate, to be proactive, because the dynamics of society is slower than that of uh, technology or the dynamics of the climate, in, in a way. We need to be proactive. Uh, there is a, a certainly a huge impact on society and humanity. It's not a, a, an existential crisis, as you mentioned, but it is certainly a huge impact. And th th there is a, also another uh, important point that I would like to stress. Uh, we have been talking about the role of panels with respect to policymakers, and, uh, uh, but there is also the role of the panels with respect to scientists. Uh, a, a huge amount of publications are being published and, published and uh, uh, it's uh, important to have a, a trusted body that say, here do we stand? And here, uh, here are uh, the great points, here is what we know and here is what uh, we know less and uh, what needs to, to be done. And, um, and also there is a clear need of international collaboration. Now there are differences that are uh, uh, very uh, important. Uh, the, the climate is very complex but well defined. It's not the same thing for AI, AI and computational science in general. It's not as clearly and sharply defined as the climate. Uh, moreover, 
the criteria of what's desirable and what needs to be done is clear for the climate up to some point. It's very subjective for AI up, uh, with respect to cultural issues and different differences in values and how we view uh, the, uh, the uh, desirable evolution of uh, society. And, uh, and uh, 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 of course, for, for the moment, there are nothing like the COP conferences uh, for computational technology and, and AI. So, uh, and the last difference is the role of corporations and industries in, in contributing to uh, the, the field, in advancing uh, the state of the art science, and also in deployment and technology that can go uh, very fast in some areas and slower in other areas. So, we have to take all this together to transpose what is needed in terms of uh, a, a, a global um, a body of, uh, of, uh, of uh, experts, of uh, scientists, in order to clarify the state of the art and what needs to be done, but also what are the possible effects and uh, the, uh, the desired investigation in order to better understand them to clarify the choices. Is there such a global partnership? Yes, that's, that's uh, the uh, global partnership on AI. There were a number of initiatives that have been discussed for the last three, four years, uh, in particular at the G7 level, and uh, there, was a, 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 there was a conference in this, uh, in this same uh, room for uh, three days uh, by the end of October, uh, the Global Forum on AI for Humanities, and there are discussions going on in order to set a global partnership on AI, which is a, a body of a government of states uh, that should be open and on a voluntary basis and mix bottom-up uh, investigation and thinking and assessment of the state of the art from experts as well as uh, drive from policymakers. So is it connected to the announcement that Emmanuel Macron did exactly. on the French and Canada-led uh, exactly. initiative? Exactly, and he also uh, insisted in finding in this, in, in this field a third way between, uh, between uh, development and deployments that are driven uh, by mostly by economy and competition and others that may be driven uh, by, uh, let's say, the desire of state to control, to, to have a better control and hold of, of uh, its society. So uh, th this is something that uh, uh, I believe most scientists in the, the field are hoping for and tr try to, uh, to, to push uh, within this uh, global partnership on AI. So is it right to say that, Fran that France has clear ambitions of leading the way in, uh, 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 with our Canadian friends, actually, and, and uh, in the field it, of AI? Yeah, it is shared at the, the uh, European level by, by most European scientists that we have been in touch with uh, throughout Europe, but also by uh, many colleagues uh, and scientists uh, from Asia and from uh, Canada, of course, and uh, from the US as well. Very good. Lamine, can I come to you? Uh, Senegal is, uh, is involved in a fascinating project that is the, green, uh, the Great Green Wall that involves 14 countries to, to fight against desertification. Can you please tell us more about it and what's the, the role of researchers, the involvement of the research side in this, uh, in this initiative? Thank you very much. Uh, before answering to your question, I want to thank CNRS for two reasons. The first is uh, for inviting me to exchange with you about this uh, important uh, topic, building a global scientific world. The second reason is uh, that uh, 25 years ago, CNRS gives me the opportunity to do my thesis here in France in a CNRS laboratory. And uh, after this uh, thesis of neuroscience, I go back, go back in Senegal and work for Senegal for Africa. But this thesis was the first step to build a research collaboration between CNRS and Francis. And now I am the director of an international unit of research built by CNRS in Africa. So thank you very much, CNRS. <laughs> uh, for answering to your question, I want to talk about uh, the model of Green Grid Wall of Sahara. It is an African Union program with a strong involvement of uh, 14 governments. The main objective of this 
GGW is to build sustainable actions against desertification, so it is against climate change. The area of all the activities of this uh, model cover 8,000 uh, uh, kilometers between Senegal and Djibouti. It is a big challenge, and it is now clear that the relevant results can't be reached without a strong research activity and capacity building. And I want to point out here that many difficulties and failures in international program in African countries are due to the lack of human resources in general and of human resources in research in particular. In Senegal, the, this project of GGW result has good results because uh, a big involvement of the government, but we have the opportunity to work in this project. Uh, our laboratory, our international laboratory, is the advisor, the scientific advisor of the national agence of this project. So we can uh, do inter interdisciplinary research is possible in these areas, in all these areas, and we implement research in environment and research in health. I think it is very important to, to do research in all these international projects about uh, environment. So you also raise an important point, it's the interdisciplinary yes. approach. So that leads me to you, Francois, uh, and the question of migrations, because do you want to tell us, uh, I, I, I let you do it, uh, what's the objective in the field of migrations? What is in the works? Uh, we have taken uh, an initiative together with uh, European researchers from Germany, uh, England, uh, uh, Spain, uh, Eastern country, and so on, also with American scholars, are trying to create a sort of equivalent to IPCC uh, panel for migrations. But in fact, it's, it's very difficult. We're just beginning. And there is a deep reason for that, for this difficulty, because and in most uh, sphere of uh, social and economic activity, we have very clear uh, indicators of good or bad governance. We know that uh, an increase in the expectancy of life is a good thing, in the expectancy of life and good health. We know that uh, a decrease in the rate of unemployment is a good uh, indicator of governance. And since already in the, in the 18th century, the physiocrats, uh, Kenney, Dupont de Nemours, uh, Mirabeau, the father, had the idea that population growth was a good indicator of, was an indicator of good governance. So it, it was very simple. Uh, but what is a good indicator of governance for migrations? And this is the, the, the issue. Uh, because in fact, migration policy is very dependent on the movements of, of public opinion. And uh, what is the role of experts in these areas? Uh, well, it is almost nil. It is almost nil, because what stands for expertise in this area to the eye of the authorities is mainly the opinion polls. Uh, in most Western countries, uh, the majority of the public uh, thinks that there are too many foreigners. They are not sufficiently uh, integrated. They take the work of the nationals. Uh, they take an excessive share on, of the uh, social protection. Uh, they may replace a native population, and so on and so on. So uh, what are then the relevant indicators of good governance uh, in the field of migration? Uh, I think that it's very difficult to imagine that an international panel of experts uh, could develop consensual uh, governance indicators on the number and destiny of uh, migrants, so just this, uh, and that states could uh, adjust their policies accordingly. So. Uh, on the right, for example, indeed, but also in a, in a, in a, for a significant part of the left, uh, it is a sign of good government to control migration uh, flows, the flow of entries, to ensure that the internal growth 
um, uh, outweighs the exogenous growth to uh, select skills adapted to the needs of the economy, to select the more, most assimilable uh, cultural uh, origins, and, and, and so on and so on, to make national sovereignty prevail. And for the fringes on the, the opinion on the, on, on the left, good governance of migration is nearly the opposite. Uh, it must uh, uh, regain the true spirit of the uh, right of asylum recognized by the Geneva Convention, respond to emergencies by uh, unconditional uh, hospitality, it must ensure the protection of minors uh, without reserve, it must be a privilege in humanitarian on the secu security and so on, and reach a country by the di diversity of origins. So each line of action in these two series have, can have its quantitative uh, expression, its own indicator. But uh, is this indicator supposed to move forward or downward? Uh, where are the consensual indicators that would uh, certify the good governance for all? And who and should uh, set? Uh, yes, I have a uh, question for Sir. Who, sh who should set those indicators? Who? should set these indicators. As you said, the, For example, the take, concerns uh, are very there is, different There is a, the uh, a fascinating and excellent publication each year by OECD on the integration indicators uh, of uh, migrants and descendants of migrants. Uh, for example, they calculate uh, the ratio of unemployment of migrants vis-a-vis -vis the unemployment of natives, uh, and they show that more, more or less it's a ratio two to one, something like that. Okay, now what w will we do with this? You have a lot of, 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 uh, of solutions to stop uh, work migration or to develop a uh, policy of integration of migrants, and uh, of, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay. uh, um, what we tried uh, in designing this future migration IPCC, I would say, uh, is to, well, to discard, to, to not to enter into these uh, political or metaphysical uh, dichotomies between uh, the praise of uh, diversity versus the praise of uh, ethnic uh, homogeneity, for example, and to uh, try to establish the facts. But this is very difficult. For example, uh, when we look at the, the figures of uh, the, the asylum seekers in Europe in these last five years, uh, and in the political debate, there is, uh, what is handled is constantly absolute numbers. So, of course, in countries like uh, Germany, France, etc., it's very impressive. But in fact, if you, take, uh, if you look at the number of asylum seekers, uh, related to the population of the host country, to the wealth per capita of the host country, the ranking of the countries, the pressure they are supposed to, to, uh, to suffer from uh, asylum seekers is completely different. Okay. And so and the policies, but the, our policies are determined by the supposed attractivity we have or we have not vis-a-vis -vis the immigrants. So we try to, yes, to, to, to explain this. I had the opportunity to explain this uh, uh, indispensable use of relative numbers to 40 MPs in the Assemblée Nationale. So it was a rather interesting experience, mm -hmm. but I can see that some of them are very interested, but the, the, the system of resistance is very high okay. because there is a triangle, the public opinion, the experts, uh, and the, uh, the, the policy makers. And what is the policy makers will hear the experts only if the public opinion is uh, enlightened. Well, by the, the question of the public opinion is also very important. Peter, you wanted to come in, and Thomas as well. Yeah, because um, the, the issue of, of metrics, how do you measure whether something is good or bad? I mean, in social sciences, that must be absolutely horrible because it becomes, um, it becomes very ideological. But even in the natural sciences, it is not easy. I mean, we are getting used to the one and a half degree of the two degree target in, in climate policy, which is a very, very simplified measure of a science-based target that has served very good to communicate issues, but it doesn't actually say very much if you, because it's, it's a global number um, and the impacts in the Arctic are very high. The impacts in other places are relatively modest at one and a half or two degrees. So it doesn't actually say a lot, but it has worked tremendously well uh, in order to communicate. Um, there's a self-organized group of, uh, of researchers who are trying to do the same across a much broader set of science-based targets, something called the Earth Commission, led by 
uh, Rockström that I think uh, was brought up a little bit earlier, precisely to try to say, well, what could be some of the science-based targets that could help policymakers formulate policies on biodiversity, on land use, on water, and, and so on. Uh, and we are trying to feed into to that debate with the knowledge that we have around the resource use. Uh, because we do have a report that came out six, seven, eight years ago where there was an estimate that the overall resource consumption should be brought down to something like six tons per capita globally if we are to be sustainable. Uh, but there's a relatively limited science base behind that number, so we're trying to establish that science base. Uh, and I think, again, it, it's a way of trying to communicate something that is very, very complex into something that is very, very simple. And I can see that that's precisely the same challenge that you're sitting with when you're talking about migration, because it is complex and it's full of, of pitfalls. So, Thomas first and then Malik. Thank you. Just develop a couple of points. Uh, review assessment. I think that's important uh, to retain that uh, the IPCC, the IPBES, they're not doing their own research, they review and assess existing research. That's why they depend so much on upstream uh, research uh, funded and carried out. Uh, they review the and existing assess. That's research. That's why it's called the AR6, the assessment report. So the IPCC is not carrying out their own research projects, they review and assess existing... So it's very different from what, what, what we heard uh, about the resources panel, uh, right? ...retain uh, what really, on uh, the substance point of view, uh, different panels uh, are doing. And the IPCC is doing this in three uh, big working groups, basically. Working group one is on physical uh, science-based uh, base. Working group two is on impact adaptation vulnerabilities. Working group three is on mitigation. This underlines the importance of interdisciplinarity. And in particular, uh, not only interdisciplinarity, but also the importance of the social sciences. Because it becomes more and more clear that the solutions are not only technological, the solutions are very much uh, linked to lifestyles, to uh, behaviors, and then some of the issues proposed they may like, should we eat less meat, also get uh, quite ideological, also uh, on climate change. Social sciences, if you look at the IPBES, there is still in the global assessment just a bit more than half were uh, scientists from natural scientists, 32% were social scientists, 9% were interdisciplinary scientists. And this becomes more and more important that we have a new kind of uh, sustainability science of also people trying, uh, as you also have mentioned, uh, to bring things together to look at an overall compass for the 21st century. Because it's too easy just to look at uh, CO2 uh, equivalent or uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. We need to look at all the planetary boundaries. And then, as it's done in the donut, for instance, of Kate Rayworth, also at the social foundations, bring all of this together. Uh, try and define for humanity what is a safe and just operating space. And this necessarily requires to move into complexity very differently as we are uh, doing uh, so far. And uh, maybe even bring it a step further, it also demonstrates uh, very much how finally, how deep is the change. Because all those issues, even migration, climate change, they're all linked. They require holistic answers in terms of sustainability transitions. And this goes very deep. This is changing all our systems. And maybe uh, to make it very clear what this means, it is uh, behavior, lifestyle, economic model. It's almost uh, rebuilding the cathedral, including the foundation, uh, while we are praying inside. And what kind of science panels do we need uh, it's, it's almost a question, do we need a panel of panels? Do we need a panel that looks at how do we survive on this planet in the Anthropocene? And then suddenly you get into completely uh, different uh, questions, bringing maybe together those uh, different issues we are uh, 
uh, dealing uh, about and uh, trying to bridge. Okay, let's keep this question of panel of panels, no, panel of panels, yeah, uh, for, the, for later on, because that's really a matter of coherence between the different panels. Malik, what kind of expert panel are you dreaming of for artificial intelligence? Uh, well, I wanted to go to two points with respect to, to AI. The first point, in, in, in my view, uh, the uh, role of assessment is common to all the panels that uh, I thought about, and uh, in particular the, the one with respect to AI. The issue is not to make research or address research, but to assess the state of the art and uh, where, uh, where we are and where we may go. The other point is the issue of metrics which is as hard for uh, metrics and criteria for uh, technical areas such as AI, computational science, as for social areas. So what's desirable, what's good and what's bad? It's not up to the scientists to make the choice. I don't believe that the scientists are better, in a better position to, to choose the criteria with which we are going to assess where we, we want to go. It's a, a matter of democratic debate, of social choices, and it cannot stand without a strong involvement of all the citizens. It is a matter of social choice, but the role of scientists is to raise the awareness, to explain where, what are the possible effects of this trajectory with respect to that one, to explain, to, to perform experiments, including social experiments, on possible effects of some choices and to make uh, citizens participate and contribute and be aware of the consequences of the consequences of their choices. So the role of scientists is really to clarify what are the options with respect to different choices of criteria. And this is the case in particular for AI, where issues of uh, privacy, of uh, security, of sa sa safety issues can be, th can be thought differently with respect to uh, liberal uh, political view, uh, very libertarian view, or uh, uh, let's say less liber libertarian one, uh, or uh, 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 a political view where, which, which puts forward society more strongly than the, the, the individual, I in addition to other things with respect to free will uh, and a freedom of a person with, with the, the help of systems, different systems, uh, that uh, can be alienating up to some point, in addition to issues regarding employment, the role of machines in our environment and so on. So these are very tough, difficult issues, and scientists have to raise the awareness and, uh, and, and, and bring the issues to the political debate and the uh, citizens' uh, choices. Okay, we'll come back to some of these issues, but Stephanie, did you want to come in? Mm. Yes, maybe. Maybe I can make two, two remarks. The first one in the in the same uh, in the same way that um, the in fact the independence of the expert must be effectively absolute, and the scientific experts give information on the state of the art. It is not up to them to say what to do or what not to do. It is up to them to say what is going to happen or not happen in different possibilities. So. And um, if, um, if we, we continue along or, or not or on this path, and on the contrary, if we have to stop for some projects. And secondly, um, I think that, uh, uh, as you say, so for, for migration, that uh, ecology is a science of complexity. And um, may, if I can make uh, uh, an example uh, to bring uh, uh, we were for, for the, the, the construction of uh, wind uh, turbines in the Bay of Saint Brieuc. Good idea for uh, renewable uh, energies, although the components of wind turbines uh, will be discussed, but uh, there is not our purpose here. The consequence is the noise pollution that makes the scallops flee to the British fishing zone. <laughs> so, and the anger of the fishermen. So, science as scientists are therefore led to study this question and now propose sounds that will bring back the scallops to the Bay of Saint Brieuc. So that's an example, but I, I think that's interesting to, to put it because it's, uh, an, uh, if, uh, it's always very difficult. Uh, and all this to say that the scientists propose the different scenarios, uh, policy makers have them. Okay, 
<laughs> yes, François. Yes, I think that's unfortunately the distinction between uh, the researchers who establish the facts and uh, the policy makers who make that choice is not that simple. Because uh, what we observe uh, in my field and certainly in others is that uh, the policy makers make a great use of statistics or scientific or pseudoscientific data. And for example, in the last uh, debate on migration ordered by the government, uh, all the MPs of the majority uh, were awarded uh, 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 the brochure of uh, seven, eight pages with a lot of statistics. And some of them were perfect, others were very strange. And in fact, uh, there was a great use of absolute numbers instead of uh, relative numbers. And an international comparison uh, with absolute numbers doesn't make sense. So when you see that, and when MPs are consulting you to, to ask you your, your opinion about that, you're obliged to, to, to contradict uh, the, 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 the objective or the objectified or pseudo-objectified pseudo data that are used by the governments. And I would say that you, you can see exactly the same thing in the very harsh public debate about the grand remplacement, the replacement of our civilization by uh, people coming from abroad. They use statistics. They are reading a lot of demography. We have never, the demography, I'm a demographer, we have never, uh, we have never seen such a use of demography in the immigration debate. So, uh, uh, and if you contradict this, uh, vulgar political use of scientific data, you are interfering, you are entering into the, uh, a new scenery. Uh, uh, we don't have any monopoly of, of science. We are competing with journalists, uh, poll makers, uh, essayists, polemicists, uh, etc., etc. So the, it's an overcrowded <laughs> scene. And so, of course, I would like to say that facts are here to bring uh, more serenity vis-à-vis uh, -vis the passions of the p political debate, which is the, 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 the old way to see. But in fact, no. It's uh, and sometimes even the facts are uh, contested; they are uh, challenged uh, as uh, mere, as you know, uh, uh, matters of opinion. Okay, but the question of the, of the relationship between scientists and policymakers is actually really important. So, a question I have for all of you is, uh, how do this panel can influence the research agenda, especially uh, in the, at the funding level? There is an assessment taking place of the, uh, of the science, uh, the existing science, but how can it really um, make a priority in a specific area. Francoise, do you want to come in on that? Difficult question. But I think that... I have an even more difficult <laughs> afterwards, yeah. Well, I, I think that this is a, a deep debate about the position of the scientists relative to the society. But considering the evolution of the society today and the evolution of the world, and also considering the fact that uh, we have big challenges in front of us. We have to take care also about the question and uh, uh, the way of uh, responding to the question. Uh, we were also very interested by sustainable science. It is like uh, Monsieur Jourdain, la prose, we are doing sustainable science without knowing that we are doing that. But, uh, in fact, sustainable development goals are a new way of looking at the questions. It's, an ecosystem, it's like an ecosystem-based complexity. It means that, first, there is basic research that we know well. And if we want to go deep relative to this question, we have to be a scientist first. But after that, if somebody else, the society or the policymakers are asking you, okay, for climate, what we will do? What we have to do first? It's a question that you can say, no, uh, it's not my problem, but yes, it is our problem also. So we have to find a new way of doing science in the future. 
And I think that for the ocean, which is my uh, object, I think it's interesting because this is a last environment which is from nature. And it's not today uh, something which is integrated in the social representation. But in the future, uh, if you, you consider the, the space on the earth, we will have to go in the ocean. And it means that all the economy will be also very different about this environment. And so it means that well, we have to think, and the, institu the institution have to think about this question of open science to the society. Okay, so if we take a very concrete example, uh, you mentioned the 1.5 degrees, and in fact, uh, a lot of research funded by the EU has been conducted in that field, and, uh, and it's been taken, uh, it's been assessed by the IPCC, right? But the other way around, how can the IPCC, or how did the Commission take on board the IPCC conclusion into its work program? So it happens very clearly both ways. First of all, uh, you need to really have a forward-looking research agenda to get uh, the knowledge base on which those reviews and assessments by panels can take place. But then also the other uh, way around, uh, there are some conclusions uh, coming out of those uh, panels uh, which need to be translated into policy. So if you look, for instance, at the Clean Planet for All communication and the target uh, climate neutral uh, Europe by 250, this is very much uh, informed by uh, work uh, from the IPCC. Now, of course, one possible uh, issue with this is that uh, as time advances, also the conclusions from those panels advance. And uh, if you look, I had a very nice slide, but okay, it couldn't uh, be showed, uh, which is in the United in Science report for the Climate Action Summit, which shows the reasons uh, for concern of the IPCC reports, okay, most of you, I think, know this table, over time. How over time, the last 10 years or so, uh, the red and even the, the deep purple has gone down in the temperature range, showing that even at lower temperatures, it's already much worse than we thought before. And this is, uh, raises the question, are those uh, panel results too conservative? Reality has proved that the situation has become each time over the period more serious. Can we expect that now uh, in the AR6 it will become more serious again? What will be the policy conclusions of this? Does this mean to uh, step up to uh, speed up the ambition? Probably yes, but let's say that's the kind of um, difficult field in which uh, policy uh, will have to uh, interchange with those results and also take them up as far as they evolve uh, further over time. So is it also the role of scientists to, to bring uh, some urgent messages to the, to, the, to the panels? Is there a way, how, how do you, Lamin, in, in your region, you, you're also working in, uh, in health, right? Uh, you, you, you're working with infectious diseases in particular. So you're seeing a reality on the ground. So if there was a specific area of urgency where research is critically needed, how would you, uh, how would you proceed? How would you make sure that this message go ba goes back up to expert panels? Thank you. Uh, uh, I can give the examples of our activities with the community and policy makers, because I think uh, when we work in a complex problem, like env environment, we can't have result often without working with communities and with policy makers. So uh, at the beginning, it was very difficult, but we tried to, to work with policy makers uh, in first and with communities. And after we have many opportunities to deal with this health problem, 
and there's environmental uh, problems. Uh, so our laboratory, our international unit of CNRS and UCAT have developed, uh, I think, relevant actions in research and in, uh, in, uh, in capacity building. So it gives us opportunities to, to do fundraising. Uh, actually, our laboratory have, uh, have work in one call uh, made by the World Bank to build uh, centers of excellence in Africa, and we was, we was funded $8 million for uh, four years to make research in environment and health and to do capacity building. Uh, what was the result? We go in the communities and say that uh, now in Africa, uh, there is no new challenge in health. It is non-communicable disease. Uh, just after the independence, all the programs of the health programs are in infectious disease. But now, with globalization, with migration, the non-communicable diseases are the, ch the new health challenge in Africa. And the World Bank know it, and they fund us to do this work. We work uh, in, um, in desertification by identifying what species of plants can resist uh, uh, when we have not enough raining. And our, our laboratory have identified all the plants who can uh, resist to the lack of raining. And this uh, result to give us opportunity to, to do fundraising. Very good. So back to the question of the urgency of action. Um, migration, artificial intelligence, or the scallops in Saint-Brieuc, they are all a reality that moves very fast. So how do you tackle that from a scientific point of view and make sure that the policymakers hear the message? Well, we, for example, I take the example of the, the, the Institut d'Immigration, Institut Convergence Migration. And uh, from the very beginning, it's, uh, uh, we try to, to have, uh, to insist on the uh, uh, importance of communication to the community service also with the environment because we are established in the new campus Condorcet in the suburbs, uh, nor northern suburbs of Paris. And uh, we, uh, have uh, uh, hired a journalist in order to, to have a, a better communication. We uh, write tribunes, we have a website, and so on. Well, the classical ways, uh, a lot of, uh, 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 of uh, research centers do uh, develop now. Uh, we multiply the encounters with the politicians, but, well, it's, uh, it's still on this very sensitive issue. I think this is, uh, issue is much more sensitive that, than any others. In, you, you have just to see the, the public debate. And I know that there is a, a trend which consists in saying, ah, but you should connect it with climate because cl climate migrations are very important, etc. I must confess that up to now, I don't see very well uh, my the uh, the cl cl climate migrations. I don't, uh, I don't understand. I have, we, have, we have, don't have a lot of evidence saying that really the displaced population do correspond to international migrations. There is a, an excellent report last year made by uh, the, the, um, uh, one of the international organizations, I, th I think it's uh, the World Bank, I'm not sure, but about uh, the, the migration, the displacement created by my, uh, my climate change. Okay internal displacement, what happens with the, uh, the rising level of the sea, etc., etc. What strikes me is the incredible popularity of this topic, the climate migration. And it's a way now to sensitize uh, the public and the, the, the polit with this uh, uh, idea that, okay, now we have two kinds of migration. Demographic migrations created by the uh, uh, population growth, especially in South uh, Africa, and climatic migration. It's a way of 
ob objectifying the threat of migration, of using the climate or using demography to uh, uh, create a, a certain mood vis-à-vis uh, -vis migration. I, and I think this is a very bad way uh, of operating. I and there's think. a year of And we had in the past, uh, uh, 30 years ago, the idea that in order to sensitize uh, the people with the, the topic of uh, uh, aging, which is a very serious topic, we could also use uh, the migration topic. And this is a famous report of the United Nations on replacement migrations. Is it possible to use only uh, migration, young migrants, in order to rejuvenate the population or to counter the aging process? And it has created a lot of misunderstanding. Okay. So I think I'll that this kind of connection, which is uh, uh, preferred, by the, 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 the politicians love this. They are fond of of, of climate migrations, but to me they are extremely abstract, and I think we should study why it is so popular, and why there is such a discrepancy between the facts and the way it is uh, echoed in the public debate. The public opinion clearly has uh, a role to play, but I'd like to ask you the same question, Malik, because the, the, the public debates also have a huge pace. Yes, uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, the role of panels to influence, to shape the uh, research agenda is uh, very important and can uh, be entailed by just a, a frequent assessment of where do we stand. This is one thing. The other thing is to shape the agenda not only by saying here are the dark points that need more research, but also to foster more integrative research, more interdisciplinary research. This is certainly an, an area where uh, scientists, technologists, and social scientists have to work together to understand the effect of this communication interaction uh, technologies and decision making are, and, uh, and decision helping uh, affect us. And they are affect us, affecting us deeply. And this uh, integrative and interdisciplinary research are not that easy in the academic world. They are, they are quite difficult because they involve a significant overhead and because the way academic research is organized is mostly to favor the uh, vertical developments more than the horizontal ones. And uh, we, we have to move forward with, uh, in that direction, more integrative research. And uh, one aspect is also to carry out uh, wide experiments. Uh, wide experiments in, not only uh, within, within laboratories and uh, on computers and so on, but with social experiments. And this is not something that we, we do, the, the effect of this piece of technology on our way of behaving and uh, interacting with each other, working and so on. And uh, this may uh, give us a bit of time to understand how to um, push some developments and how to be more reluctant towards other developments. Uh, will this lead us to new ways of doing research? I believe uh, in a way, yes, because if we favor more integrative and interdisciplinary research, it already be, uh, will be a significant step with respect to yeah, uh, where we stand now. Good. Thomas. Thank you. I want to pick uh, this up. Very important, interdisciplinary research. I want to add one point to this, the what and the how. We do a lot about the what. We may have been neglecting the how. We are facing wicked problems cross-cutting big transitions, and how to move forward, how to overcome inertia is part of the wicked problem. And there, we don't know enough. And this is also where interdisciplinary uh, research, where uh, sustainability science can help. But then, it is moving even closer to policy. Because if you look at the how question, it means that scientists then also uh, move into giving options to politicians how they could uh, solve the issues. And then it is naturally closer to ideological spaces than if you only stay in uh, the what. But it doesn't go any longer uh, without it. If we do not go also into those how questions, I don't think we will uh, move forward. And this is relevant for science, but it's, I think, also relevant for uh, expert panels. 
Okay, because we are very, uh, we are reaching out uh, uh, the, the time for lunch. Uh, let me wrap up and uh, by asking you one thing that you think the one ingredient that would make an international expert panel successful and useful. One thing, 15 seconds each. Stephanie. Okay. The <coughs> We have to build a, a, a global uh, scientific world uh, to face uh, two uh, global problems. I think that uh, I want to witness uh, that uh, we, we didn't ask uh, about, we, we don't talk about uh, the creation of the Belmont Forum uh, 10 years ago. And I think that uh, it's quite important to, to make uh, this, um, to, to ask, to, to talk about this, because the Belmont Forum is a partnership of funding organizations, international science councils, and regional consortia committed to the advancement of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary science. And uh, it's implementing a global open data policy and principle with input from scientific and stakeholder communities. So it's uh, 29 funding agencies on six continents. Collaborative Research Action had funded 99 different projects and the support uh, more than 10,000, uh, 1,000 scientists and stakeholders in more than 35 countries. Good. So it's Thank a beginning. You. But Thank you uh, for mentioning it. It looks like 15 seconds is not quite enough. Lamin, 20 seconds for you. Uh, I can talk about Africa. For making a successful international panel in Africa, I think it is important to make focus in capacity building and collaborative research. Very good. Francois, you do have 15 seconds. Uh, I think that each panel should have uh, as a motto, uh, no demagogy, but pedagogy. Very good. Malik. I may add uh, open debates and bottom-up organization. Very good. Better. One word, uh, coherence. I think it's important that there is uh, coherence and that the different science panels strive to have coherence between the types of messages and they give and they investigate why is it that sometimes we come up with different answers. Um, and there is a resolution coming out of the last UN Environment Assembly asking UN Environment precisely to set up a group to, to have a dialogue between some of the major assessments and the IPCC and IPBES and IRP and others are, are part of that dialogue now and it can gradually be expanded. So that's the panel of panels. The panel of panels is already there. Very good. Francais. Final words. Um, I think that uh, basic research is a way of life. And so I think that also that we have to explain why it's so important, this way of life. Very good. Thomas? So we know we need unprecedented change. We know it's probably almost a new era coming up. But what we still need is to make it a positive vision. A positive vision. And if you look at the IPBES conclusions, one of the major leverage points is new visions for a good life, including also maybe indigenous value systems, other value systems. And how can uh, panels help us for this positive vision of our future and of mastering the Anthropocene? Thank you for mentioning positive vision, since the next topic right after the lunch will be science and optimism. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've done a great job. We will now go. Uh, we will now break for lunch, and we are back here at 2:15.